in thanking our first brave writing fellow, Lindsay. I'm also super excited about Googling Tiffany's mall video and worm charming later tonight, so thank you for that gift. Um, me, would you like to come back up and introduce our next reader? Yeah, more jerking off. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the real Abigail Sharp? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Abigail Sharp is the funniest writer I know. In her stories, talking rats do taxes to win a lady's love, an overbearing mother berates her daughter for what she describes as her huge titties. A teenage girl asks her teacher, can I say something to you? and tells her, frankly, kindly, you look like a slut, <laughs> but you don't know how to act like one. I bet lots of people have given, you the have given you a lot of opportunities. It's okay that you're like that. But funny is not all that Abigail's writing is. It's also serious and wise. She said in an interview once that she finds it difficult to look at anything head on, and is always trying to talk about one thing by talking about something completely different. In this roundabout way, I write in tackles both the personal, like what it means to be a daughter, and a sister, and a lover, to the grand, like, I'm sorry, Abigail, <laughs> the inheritance of the Holocaust, and the, contem and the contemplation of what truth is, and if, it, and if it can be grasped. I write in is both irreverent and the mature wrestling of the weight of, with the weight of history. She says she's drawn to fiction that can hold uncertainty, approaching the limits of our understanding, and asking difficult questions about ourselves and our material world. And that's exactly what our fiction is. Again, we are lucky to hear her tonight. Abigail Sharp is a writer from Chicago. Our fiction has appeared in the Paris Review, Granta, New England Review, and other publications, as a, and has received support from, and recognition from the Granum Foundation the Miami Book Fair Margin Writers Fellowships, and the, and the Desperate Literature Short Fiction Prize. She was the winner of the 2023, of the 2023 Disquiet Literary Prize, and received a BA from Wesleyan University, and MFA from Missional Center for Writers in, in Austin, Texas, where she was the fiction editor of Bat City Review. She's an assistant editor at American Short Fiction. Welcome, Abigail Sharp. So nice. Um, I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> I I was convinced that was gonna happen. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you to Falk, to all the staff at Falk. This has been like the most unreal experience. Everything you do for us is is sort of unimaginably generous. Um, so I really appreciate it. Lindsay and Jeff, you're both so amazing. I feel like really genuinely honored. And whole cohort, I have something written here that just says, I love you guys, um, <laughs> but I, I really, I, I really do. Um, I, I feel so lucky to be here with you. Uh, all right, I'm gonna be reading from the novel that I've been working on here. Um, I'm gonna read a slightly abridged for time version of the second chapter. And for a little bit of context, it follows a narrator who's come to teach English literature at an all girls boarding school in a remote coastal town on the Atlantic. Um, she's been hired for the year as a temporary leave replacement for another teacher. And in the first chapter, she arrived, and she went to a bar, and that's like all that happens, so you don't really need to know anything else. The topic of my seminar for juniors was the literature of the city, a subject I had chosen because it was so vague I could think of many novels that were set in cities. It had taken me 30 minutes to write the syllabus. We were not in the city here, and therefore I could ask my students if conversation flagged to make thoughtful comments about the ways in which this remote coastal tourist town was different from an urban environment. What is your favorite city, I might ask, and why? 
Later in the semester, I would have the class compose sonnets about their most beloved aspects of contemporary urban life in the global west, such as cars, boutique salad restaurants, or hostile architecture in public spaces. I planned to say the same thing about all of the novels we read, plagiarized directly from texts I had been studying before I dropped out of graduate school. Country and city are very powerful words, I would say, and this is not surprising when we remember how much they seem to stand for in the experience of human communities. My students, 12 of them, sat in the semicircle of desks I had arranged around a central whiteboard that hung from the rafters, upon which I had written, what is a city? They wore the academy's uniform, a knee-length pleated maroon skirt, a white polo shirt, patent leather shoes. It was a blustery morning, and from where I stood, I could hear something smacking repeatedly against the window glass behind me, though the shade was drawn, and I couldn't tell what it was. I feared it might be something evil. I had been on a double dose of my prescribed amphetamine stimulant when I came up with the course topic, and I was on a double dose of my prescribed amphetamine stimulant now for the first day of class. My prescribed amphetamine stimulant was not a methamphetamine, my psychiatrist had hastened to tell me. I should not be concerned that my stimulant was a methamphetamine just because of its name. I should think of it, he said, as methamphetamine's cousin. I told him I was really happy to be prescribed methamphetamine's cousin. In general, I tried to be cheerful and encouraging during my monthly telehealth appointments because I worried that my psychiatrist might be suicidally depressed. In between statements about dosage and hydration, he would often sigh loudly and gaze at something beyond his laptop that I couldn't see. Over time, I became convinced that he was looking at the image of someone he had once loved who had been brutally murdered by a repressive state, or perhaps who had cheated on him with another more successful psychiatrist. <laughs> Sometimes during our appointments, he would excuse himself, stand up, and shuffle out of view of his laptop's camera, leaving me to stare at his empty desk chair until he returned one to two minutes later and began speaking again as if he had never left. Every time my psychiatrist prescribed me a new medication, he would say, you won't get addicted to this, right? And then we would share a nice laugh. I was glad to provide my depressed psychiatrist with some moments of levity in what seemed to be an otherwise desolate existence. I had taken a double dose of my stimulant that morning because I knew deep in my heart that I was a terrible teacher, prone to irrelevant and rambling digressions about my personal life and the childhood maltreatment of Josef Vissarionovich Stalin at the hands of his drunken shoe cobbler father, that when I did manage to lecture on the topic of English literature, my lectures were boring and made no sense, and that I had a bad case of dry mouth. I knew these things deep in my heart because I had read them verbatim on an internet forum where college students commented anonymously upon the quality of their instructors back when I was teaching undergraduate classes as part of my fellowship before I dropped out of my PhD program and moved in with my parents. The stimulants did not make me any better at teaching, but they did stop me, I told myself, from living a fear-based life. When I took a double dose of my stimulants, I remembered that for every student who had insulted me on the internet, there was likely one more who was afraid to speak their mind, but who had been as moved as I was by the story of a young Joseph Stalin's mother working tirelessly as a laundress to support her beloved son, protecting him from the alcohol-fueled rages of his father so that he could one day become a man of history, a man of steel. I looked out at my students. They stared back at me with the vacant curiosity of idiot fish whose aquarium has just been tapped upon. I asked the class for a volunteer who would introduce herself and tell us about one book she had read over the summer. A pimpled girl with lank sheets of blonde hair raised her hand, her gaze fixed somewhere in the middle distance as if at a veil between worlds. She announced that her name was Anita. For some reason, she had decided to stand when she spoke to me as if I were a military captain. <laughs> this summer, she said, I read a book called The Trial. It's about a man named Kafka who gets arrested for apparently no reason. Bad things keep happening to him, and he keeps saying he doesn't know why. Anita shifted her hair from one shoulder to the other and crossed her arms in front of her chest. Honestly, she said, it didn't make sense to me. When things happen in my life, I know why. I try to take responsibility. 
I think it's important to have those kinds of values, to instill them in your family, to see them reflected in your country. This guy, Kafka, kept acting like everything was out of his control. I didn't feel sorry for him. I thought, why don't you take a little initiative, buddy? I started to thank Anita for her comments, but she ignored me and continued to speak. For example, she said, that summer she had experienced a terrible incident. She was in Los Angeles visiting her infertile aunt who lived with her new husband in a big Spanish colonial on the west side. One night, Anita said, she was going to meet some friends for dinner a few miles from her aunt's house. She requested a car to come pick her up. She saw that the driver had a 4.9 star rating and had successfully completed 378 rides. As a woman, she said, she thought it was important to keep an eye on those statistics. Pretty soon the car was caught in traffic. That was when the driver asked where she was from. She felt uncomfortable with his question because in the app she had selected quiet preferred, not happy to chat. The driver repeated his question, so where are you from, as if she hadn't heard him the first time. She could see his phone lodged in its holder next to the wheel and quiet preferred was clearly highlighted on his app too. She decided that the best way to handle the situation was to pretend that she was deaf, so she shrugged and pointed at her ears and shook her head to make it clear that she was medically incapable of hearing the driver talk to her. Everything, she said, seemed okay after that. She was enjoying her ride, looking out the window, thinking about how sad it was that she'd have to return to the academy in another month. It was raining, and all along the road, the car lights reflected off the asphalt, which made it feel like there was no ground beneath her just more lights and more cars. Then she noticed that her driver had started talking again. He wasn't looking at her, she said, and at first he spoke so quietly that she couldn't make out his words. But he kept getting louder. Eventually, she realized what he was saying. Blow job, he said. Blow job, blow job, blow job. He didn't meet her eyes in the mirror. Since she had pretended to be deaf, she couldn't admit that she heard him. She felt caught inside of something and was overcome with the sudden, sickening sense that this was only the first of many times in her life she would be caught in exactly this way. <laughs> it was a trap, a knot, a bind, Anita said. It was a terrible situation. Blow job, blow job, blow job. He continued to say it until he dropped her off at the restaurant where he waved goodbye as if everything had been normal. <laughs> if this had happened to Kafka, Anita said, <laughs> She thought he would probably have run around in circles, pulling out his own hair and screaming, but she wasn't going to do that. She had a different set of values from Kafka, who didn't seem to have any values at all, and she was going to exercise them. She believed in agency, especially the agency of women. She believed in women taking initiative. You couldn't, she said, just let things happen to you. You had to make something happen back. So as soon as she got out of the car, she called her mom, who called their family friend, who happened to be the CFO of the rideshare company. And thankfully, this story had a happy ending in that the driver had been fired and permanently banned from signing into the rideshare application on his phone or computer. Unfortunately, it was difficult for Anita now to hear the words blowjob without flashing back to that terrible evening. <laughs> when she had finished speaking, Anita sat primly down at her desk. She was sucking in her cheeks so that it appeared as though she were chewing some kind of sticky candy, though after a moment I discerned that she was only gnawing on her own gums. I thanked her for her comments. In my brain, there was a pleasant buzzing sensation, as if a group of bees were participating in an orgy at the front of my skull. I looked out at the class. The heater was on, releasing years of dust back into the air, particles that shook wildly under the fluorescent overhead lights. Students exchanged impregnable glances. I was having trouble deciding which parts of Anita's story I should address. In particular, I was unsure if I should ask Anita to, in the future, please refrain from using the phrase blowjob during my class, even in representative dialogue. I wondered if she felt any curiosity as to whether or not her driver had believed that she was deaf, or if she had considered that her story was actually two different stories the story in which the driver suspected she could hear him, and the story in which he believed she could not. But she seemed to have no interest in this, or in the fact that for the rest of her life, she would never know what was real. I thought this was really good for her. She had made a decision, and that was the narrative she was living by now. 
Most probably she had chosen the story that was more flattering to herself. Many such forks in the road would continue to present themselves to her in her life, and at each one she would continue to choose whichever option flattered her most, and then eventually she would have something called a personality. <laughs> I knew this to be accurate, because I myself had approached many forks in the road where the stories about what had happened to me seemed to thicken and diverge, and I had always chosen to believe in the narrative that painted me in the best light. Typically, this meant accepting that people were fundamentally malevolent actors who wished more than anything to violate me, bring me down, and ruin my life. <laughs> Occasionally, the thought would enter my mind that the people who had violated me, brought me down, and ruined my life may have done so only by accident without sinister intent or design. But this was the worst thought I had ever had. <laughs> and each time it emerged, I would drag it quickly into the trash file of my brain because that was my personality. <laughs> I told Anita I was sorry to hear that her driver had made repeated references to fellatio after she pretended to be legally deaf to avoid talking to him. It was a good thing for women everywhere, I said, that her family friend was the CFO of the rideshare company <laughs> and had the power to fire people at will. The Trial, I continued, turning to face the rest of the class, is a wonderful book about authority, bureaucracy, and alienation. It's a text that deals with the latent violence of modern life, something that impacts us all, and I'm so happy, Anita, to hear that you enjoyed it. One teeny correction, though, is that Franz Kafka is the author of The Trial. The protagonist is a man named Joseph K. I wrote Joseph K on the whiteboard. I assumed his name was Joseph Kafka, Anita said. She began to weep openly. <laughs> Tears ran from the corners of her eyes down to her mouth, where her tongue flicked out automatically to lap them up. The girl seated beside her, who had a mop of bright violet hair, gave her several firm but gentle pats on the back, as if burping a baby. The other students ignored the outburst and chewed their nails. Outside, a seagull screamed. That is a really fair assumption, I said. I quickly tried to think of tender things to say that would make Anita stop crying so that I would not get fired and have to once more move back in with my parents. I told her that I appreciated her sharing her logic with the rest of the class. In fact, I said, she had done me a great service by demonstrating for her classmates an example of close reading. This year, I said, turning to face the other students, I was going to be asking them all to focus on articulating their arguments by pointing to evidence in the text. Anita, I said, had just given us a perfect example of that. I saw that Anita's shoulders were still heaving gently, but she was no longer licking the tears from her face. She showed us, I continued, how she reasoned that Joseph K's last name was Kafka due to the following evidence. A, we know Joseph's last name starts with the letter K because that is the initial given to us in the text, and B, we know the author's own last name is Kafka. Though Anita's ultimate deduction was not 100% correct, it was nonetheless a fine attempt at rigorous textual analysis. <laughs> the trial, I continued, relates to the topic of this course in that it is set in an unidentified city. I gestured at the word city on the whiteboard. You can tell because it features an impoverished neighborhood. I wrote down impoverished neighborhoods. I noticed that my hand was shaking. My phone illumined itself on the desk. I had two missed calls I saw from my sister and one new voice message. The part of my brain that was stimulated by methamphetamine's cousin told me that my students would probably be very interested in hearing about my family background right now. <laughs> the other part of my brain said, maybe not. Maybe they will write that you have narcissistic personality disorder on your end of semester teacher evaluations. But that part of my brain was not very buff. Franz Kafka's The Trial, I said, also happens to be the book that my mother was reading when she first met my father in an elevator at music school in New York City shortly after she immigrated to the United States. I asked the class if they knew about the Baltic nations. No one responded. On the whiteboard, I drew a blob and divided it into three sections, which I labeled Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. I shaded in another blob to the left of the first blob and wrote Baltic Sea. I explained that these three countries were annexed into Josef Stalin's Soviet Union, first in 1940 and then again after a brief occupation by another nation in 1944. I pointed to Lithuania on the map. Though my mother was born in Vilnius, a city, I gestured once more to the word city on the board, at one time known as the Jerusalem of Lithuania due to its vibrant Jewish intellectual life, her parents, I said, were originally from other parts of the country, 
little villages in the north and the west. My mouth was getting very dry. With each word, I could hear the smacking sound of my tongue sticking against my palate. I took a sip of water from the glass on my desk and looked out at my students' shoes, all identical Mary Janes, then up at their faces, feral, shiny with highlighter and gloss, dark blush, dewy concealer, makeup designed to make them look like wet babies with brain problems. <laughs> I understood that looking like a wet baby with a brain problem was sexually attractive to men. A hot spasm of fury ran through me, not fury with men for being attracted to the physical traits most commonly associated with infants, but fury with myself for no longer looking remotely like a two-year-old. I had wasted my life, I thought. By my life, I meant the years in which I had looked most similar to a baby. My hand moved unconsciously to my own cheeks, undeniably the cheeks of an adult with a chronic fungal infection who woke each morning to find flakes of yellowish skin piled on the pillow like fish food. I asked the class if they knew which country had briefly occupied Lithuania in between its two annexations by Josef Vissarionovich Stalin's Soviet Union. The girl with the violet hair raised her hand. Germany, she said. It was Nazi Germany. Excellent, I said. On the whiteboard, I drew a flag with a swastika on it and an arrow pointing toward the blob that represented Lithuania. Then I crossed out the swastika and drew a hammer and sickle in its place. Did anyone in the class know the term collectivization, I asked. Had anyone ever heard of a Russian kulak? I wrote down, economic power of the kulaks. I realized that no one was listening to me, except for the girl who had answered my question, who was nodding, mouth slightly agape, with the showy enthusiasm of a born bootlicker. In the rest of my students' faces, I saw an identical slackness behind their makeup. Anita was rocking back and forth in her chair now, no longer weeping, and instead whispering what appeared to be a self-soothing incantation into her shirt collar. My eye caught on a third student who had not yet introduced herself. She sat at one end of the semicircle, her chair angled subtly away from her classmates. She was plain, with a square jaw and a thick, slovenly appearance that put one in mind of a thumb. Her body stretched at, at its shirt, with the kind of natural heft that I knew intimately was worse than fatness in that no amount of calorie cutting, intermittent fasting, purging, laxative abuse, volume eating, or over-exercising would ever make a meaningful impact. I could not read this student's expression, and yet it felt familiar to me as when encountering an object once seen in a dream. I wondered if maybe she needed to take a shit. <laughs> then it crossed my mind that what I was looking at was only the facial manifestation of a constant lurking, low-grade fear, and I relaxed. I glanced at the clock, swallowed another sip of water, and suggested to the class that we continue with introductions. I would tell them about the economic power of the kulaks, I said, at another time. I smiled at the big, plain girl, whose expression of what I now understood to be constant, low-grade fear continued to ride her face like a donkey, and whose entire life, due only to the accident of her birth, would likely be characterized by repeated scenes of rejection, false hope, and humiliation, very sad, and asked if she would introduce herself next and tell us about one book she had read that summer. If she was surprised that I had singled her out, she didn't show it. She first cast her eyes reflexively down at her hands, which she was lacing and unlacing in a kind of cat's cradle without a string, and then she met my gaze and gave me a closed-mouthed smile. When she spoke, her voice caught me with its firmness. It was a beautiful voice, in fact, its syllables long and round, giving her speech a weirdly old-fashioned transatlantic quality. Hello, she drawled. I'm Cordelia. This summer, I read Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, in general, I'm quite interested in thinking about the citification of literary production in relation to America's urban sprawl and ever-expanding geographic hinterlands, so I'm looking forward to the class. She hesitated. On a different note, she continued, her voice ringing out even more clearly, I was wondering if you know where Mr. Nelson is. When she said Mr. Nelson, Cordelia's cadence took on what seemed to me to be a defiant aspect though the more closely I looked at her, the more difficult her affect was for me to read. When she was silent, she exuded sullen insecurity, which seemed appropriate. But when she spoke, her tones were lilting, husky, and grandiose. This combination of beauty and ugliness disturbed me. I felt that I could not assimilate the contradiction. 
At the reference to Mr. Nelson, several students smirked and several others looked down at their desks. Cordelia's eyes remained fixed on me. I was certain that I wasn't wrong about her constant lurking low-grade fear, even if it was submerged now beneath some other performance, because since the day I was born, I had moved through my own life like an animal biologically destined to be prey, and Cordelia looked exactly like me. But there was something elusive about her, a remainder I couldn't identify. It was clear, I thought, that Mr. Nelson was the teacher whose temporary leave had allowed me to secure this job so late in the season, and I also now assumed based upon Cordelia's tone and the reaction of her classmates, that she was or had been in love with him. It was possible that he had encouraged her affections. Perhaps he had seduced and molested her. Another student may have anonymously reported their relationship in a fit of concern or of malice, and Mr. Nelson might now be undergoing an internal investigation leading to my hiring for the year. If he were to be found responsible, then perhaps I would be able to keep this job for the rest of my life. None of this was unusual. It was so not unusual that it was banal. Thinking about it and about how not unusual it was was also banal. I remembered a friend I once had, before I stopped speaking to everyone I had ever met before the age of 18, who had accused me of being obsessed with pedophilia. Please stop coming to parties, taking six shots of cherry-flavored vodka, and screaming, everyone is a pedophile, she had said. Please stop screaming, women be getting date-raped at each party you attend, because it massacres the vibe, and people aren't certain if you mean there are women getting date-raped at that particular party, at that particular moment, if they should go to try and find and rescue these women right there and then, or if you're offering a more systemic critique, in which case they can continue partying. I explained to her that I was not obsessed with anything, but that if I were obsessed with something, it would not be pedophilia, but ephebophilia. No one cares about the difference between pedophilia and ephebophilia except for you, my friend said. This was exactly the point, I said. The point was that people should care. It was an essential distinction. Often when people said pedophile, what they really meant was ephebophile, in that they were referring to adults who were sexually attracted to postpubescent adolescents, not prepubescent children. Why did that matter, my friend said. <laughs> Obviously, she said, everyone got the point, whether or not you specified the child in question's relation to pubescence. It mattered, I said, because language mattered. I was a student of English literature, I reminded her. I believed in the power of language. I believed in the supremacy of speech acts. Didn't she care, I said, that when we were in high school, this conversation had taken two or three years after our graduation, six of our teachers had been actively fucking students, that all around us in high school, people were illegally thrusting and humping and fucking, and feeling each other up, people who shouldn't have been doing any of those things. Didn't she ever wonder, I asked, why none of those students had been herself? No, my friend said. She didn't wonder that. Some of those teachers, I went on, ignoring her, had been pedophiles, and some of them had been ephebophiles, and you could tell which was which based upon the age and secondary sex characteristics of the students they had molested. If my friend wanted, I could explain to her my theories about which of our teachers exactly had been pedophiles and which had been ephebophiles. I thought I had a pretty good sense at this point, because in the years since the news stories broke, I had closely studied the physical traits of each victim. I had thought about their bodies, I said, almost every day. No, my friend said. She did not want me to explain those theories. <laughs> then she asked me if, when I talked so much about pedophiles, sorry, she corrected herself, ephebophiles, it was because I actually wanted to talk about the thing that had happened to me at Benjamin Leichter's 17th birthday party, that thing that had happened after midnight when Benjamin Leichter took me into his bedroom. No, I said. It was insulting, I said, to imply that I could only take a stand against the rampant pedophilia and ephebophilia that characterized our educational system because of something unrelated that had happened to me one time with Benjamin Leichter in Benjamin Leichter's bedroom and another separate but similar thing that had happened to me several years later. My friend told me she was sorry that I was sexually frigid and incapable of experiencing orgasm with partner. <laughs> Female pleasure was beautiful, radical, and politically subversive, she said. And when she thought about the fact that I was a fundamentally sexually frigid person because of what happened to me when I was a 17-year-old virgin in Benjamin Leichter's bedroom and the other related thing that happened to me several years later, it made her want to cry. I asked her if she had ever actually cried about it, and she said no. She had never literally cried about it using her face. But that inside of her, 
the part of her soul that attended to female empowerment, often wept about the things that had happened to me and what those things had done to my capacity for sexual pleasure and my personality more generally. Thank you, Cordelia, I said to the class. <laughs> the Magic Mountain is a very long book about disease and death, both physical and spiritual, that does not take place in a city. It takes place on a mountain in a sanatorium. I turned and wrote spiritual death on the whiteboard. <laughs> I paused, then said, I'm not certain about Mr. Nelson. Maybe you can ask your advisor. I suggested that we take a small break to rest our minds and stretch our legs. A few students left for the bathroom, bowing their heads, murmuring. I stepped outside, where the wind was lifting freshly raked leaves from the courtyard and distributing them to other parts of the lawn. A pale sunshine fell upon the buildings that emerged from Campus's hill like teeth, each facade facing the bay as if in a state of expectation. The light here was sea light, forbidding, austere, not very nice. For a moment, I watched as a student I didn't know, swaddled in a puffy red jacket, trudged slowly from one cottage to another. Her head was down, as if she had lost something precious in the grass, something I was sure she would never find. I put my phone to my ear. The wind moved against my face, moved my hair back. When my sister thought about our childhood, her voicemail told me, she remembered the happiest days of her life. Personally, she would love nothing more than to return to the womb, emerge again from our mother's vagina, and live out each day of her adolescence for a second time. My sister wasn't certain why I said the things about our parents that I said, why I did the things I did. Mama and Papa were her very best friends in the world, the voicemail said. I was also, the voicemail reminded me, her very best friend in the world. She was concerned, as were my parents, about the direction my life was taking. I was too old to behave in the ways that I did. I was almost 30, said the voicemail. The wind picked up a crumpled candy wrapper from my pocket and carried it to the other side of campus where it drifted and spun atop an air current, writhing, a shiny bird showing off. Sometimes the only conclusion my sister and parents were able to come to about me, the voicemail said, was that I was biologically confused, mean-spirited, and mentally ill. Was this true, the voicemail asked. Why else, the voicemail asked, would I not also wish to re-enter my mother's vagina, like crawling up a water slide, and then slip out for a second time? Why had I dropped out of graduate school? Why was it that I no longer spoke to anyone I had ever met before the age of 18 and very few people I had met after the age of 18? The voicemail went on for several minutes, during which I mostly zoned out from the things my sister was saying and instead thought about the long handwritten letters I used to leave under her pillow while she purged her dinner in our shared bathroom when she was 16 and I was 13. Because my sister was older, she had the right to purge first, our own special kind of primogeniture, and by the time I took my turn kneeling before the toilet, the air would already be filled with the sharp, rotting smell of her intestinal juices. In my letters, I wrote that my sister had an enviable body, slim in all the right places, with perfect aquiline nipples, and that I would do anything in the world to make her happy. It was like in Dickens' most ambitious novel, Bleak House, I realized now. My sister and I had lived in the same home, but still I had left letters under her pillow instead of speaking to her out loud. Thank you. My goodness, how lucky are all of us to live in this seaside community and hear these amazing artists and writers. <laughs> Abigail Sharp, all right. <laughs> Thank you all for being here with us tonight and come back for more. Enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>